I know it's the holiday season and everything, and I know a lot of people are taking a lot of time off. People in the podcasting racket, people in the radio TV racket, you just put on your reruns, and everybody runs off to the local, to the closest mountain slash spa slash hot tub in the snow resort. Yeah, I get that. On the But at least in our little corner of the world, my only judge of whether we should do or not do a podcast is if the fellas are up to or not up to a bunch of crazy business. And yeah, the crazy business pretty much happens 24-7, 365, so I don't even, I'm not even sure we should be taking Saturday and Sunday off the way we do. But the fellas have been going, not just the fellas and... Uh, but there's a lot of argy-bargy among the people in the political world who are in denial, deceit, delusion, who are enabling this incredible level of black violence, black crime, black dysfunction, black chaos. Latest example came out in Iowa. Now, how many stories have we done on Iowa? Tons! One of the first one, of course, was Beat Whitey Night at the Iowa State Fair. Bunch of fellas on three nights in a row were beating people in the fair, out of the fair, around the fair, going to your car, from your car, three nights in a row. Finally, the new local paper got a hold of it. They got a hold of the police reports that said the fellas were stampeding around the Iowa State Fair saying, it's Beat Whitey Night. They went to Lori Lovarado. She's a sworn officer with the Des Moines Police Department. She was their public information officer. He said, Lori, what's up? What's up with all the fell, you know, what's up with all these teenagers running around the fair? Lori, what's up with that? She said, Well, yeah, it's a bunch of black people. I really, we really don't know why they're doing it, but yeah, that's what's going on out there. She got fired the next day. She was fired for telling the truth about black crime, violence, wildly out of proportion, and the black-on-white hostility underpinning so much of it. And now we come out to Iowa, where the attention of the world has just focused on the worst thing that ever happened in the world, where some white chick on methamphetamine got into a car accident with a Mexican person, 14-year-old, I think it was a 14-year-old Mexican girl, After the car accident was over, this meth head gets out of the car. She said, she told people later on she hit the girl because she was a Mexican. That's pretty bad. But does it stop the world quality bad? Well, let's see how much the world stopped. Here's the headline. Presidential candidates speak out against hate. After Iowa woman alleged intentionally ran over a 14-year-old girl. Several presidential candidates, this is from the local paper out there, spending the weekend in Iowa denounced the racist motivation behind an intentional hit and run that left a 14-year-old central Iowa girl injured this month. And the woman, her name, whatever the woman's name is, she said she did it because she was a Mexican. Yeah, she's been charged. Nobody in Iowa is standing up and going, oh, yeah, that woman had it rough. Let's uh, let's let her go, and let's make sure she doesn't go out on any bail. And let's, uh, you know, it's time for understanding and healing. That's We're not going to define that woman by the worst thing she ever did in her life. No, people in Iowa, people around the rest of the country, pretty much a lot of white people pretty much look at that and go, uh, yeah, yeah, that's a jail offense. Yeah, yeah just go to jail. Yeah, go for a long time. We'll let you know when, you know, we'll let you know, we'll let you know when we're ready to let you out. That's not really, that's not really something people even talk about. But Mr. Andrew Yang, hey, can somebody, okay, maybe I'm just getting lazy, but can somebody tell me where Mr. Andrew Yang made his gajillion dollars? I saw him, 
I was under the impression he was one of these internet billionaires. Then somebody the other day said his net worth is only worth a million. Wow. Anyway, so Biden came up and said, we'll get to, get to Yang in a minute. Biden came out and said all this. With it. What did Biden say? We are in a battle for the soul of this nation, said Joe Biden on Twitter. We cannot sit by while hate crimes surge, fueled by a president who fans the flame of white nationalism. It's up to all of us to reject intolerance in all its forms and to give hate no safe harbor. I think Elizabeth Warren pretty much said the same kind of thing. She's not really happy with people that go around hitting people with cars. She's heart sick for the teenager and her family. Okay, we get it. It's like an unbelievably bad thing. Let's ship her off to the hoose gal. So Yang came forward and he said that uh, a Latino teenager in Iowa was evidently targeted because of her race. And he went on to, you know, pour his heart out. We must do much more to strengthen our communities. You know, this Yang guy, he, 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 I think he has the distinction and it's a real and it's a very competitive environment for what I'm about to say. He has this distinct distinction of saying the purest, dumbest thing about race during this last six months of the presidential election. I mean, all the white people want to get out there and let the fellas know they're down with them. So nobody's come out and said, Yes, I carry a bottle of 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 hot sauce in my purse. But even that doesn't compare what Yang said about a few months ago about white people roaming the countryside looking for Chinese people to attack. Uh, and who is going to be the boogeyman of the next 10 to 20 years? Who's going to be the great rival to the United States in the eyes of American society? China, that's right. And so what do you think the attitude is going to be over time for the shrinking, insecure, white majority that's losing their jobs for, let's say, Chinese Americans or Asian Americans. I, I don't, I'm like, I personally, I said to a group at Harvard, I think we're one generation away from falling into the same camps as the Jews who were attacked in the synagogue in Pittsburgh, like uh, just a couple months ago. It's like, we're probably one generation away from Americans shooting up a bunch of Asians saying like, you know, damn the Chinese because there, there's a giant Cold War or even more with China. That is the great danger that I fear that my children are going to grow up in. I mean, that's stupid on so many levels. So when you talk about generations, what's that, 20 years? So Yang is predicting out into the year 2040 when white people are going to be roaming the countryside, attacking Chinese people all over the place. Yeah, let me ask you a question, Dr. Yang. What racial group is responsible for the overwhelming amount of violence against Asian people today, yesterday, five years ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago. What group is that, Dr. Yang? It's a group we've documented here quite often. It's the fellas and the lovely ladies. Why don't you just start 10 years ago when the San Francisco Chronicle ran a big story talking about the dirty little secret of San Francisco 85% of the violence on, on the, of the street crimes on San Francisco, robbery, 85% of the victims are Asian, and 85% of the, of the perpetrators are fellas. 85% during that one sample period was black on Asian. And ever since then, it's just a thing. It's a thing in Sacramento. It's a thing all over the Bay Area. And all the liberals in the Bay Area, you know, they just shrug their shoulders and they go to the meetings and they try to explain to the Asian families, to the Asian shopkeepers, to the Asian elders, they, you know, we're trying to do the best we can. And by the way, you don't need a gun because, you know, chances are if you get a gun, you're just going to shoot yourself. So here's what you do. When you see a fella on your security camera trying to get into your house, just go out there and beg for mercy. That will work. We guarantee it. You know, I think what got my attention on this is last week we did a podcast and we did videos on three separate cases of fellas using their cars 
to attack old white people, to hit them, run them over, knock them over, and then when the people are down, to get out and rob them. Three black people robbing three white people. Yeah, if you do the mathematics on whether that's a coincidence or not, let me know what you come up with because the number, that the chances are that is a coincidence is extremely low. Yes, there was intention there. Patterns reveal bias. As Senator Whitehouse was so kind to remind us of last year at the, at the Kavanaugh hearings. This is all wrong. And so, and so we know that the enormous level of black on Asian violence in this country, and there's Yang telling little fairy tales about white people somehow are going to turn their attention from Jews. Yeah, guess what, Dr. Yang? The enormous level of, of violence against Jews in this country. Who do you think's doing that, Dr. Yang? Do you think it's white guys dressed in lederhosen and brown shirts? No, Dr. Yang, it is not. It's the fellas. We know that the majority, we know that there's an enormous level of violence directed at Asians, directed at Jews, directed at Hispanics, directed at immigrants. And the best you can come up with is to predict 20 years from now, somehow white people, because we're feeling disenfranchised and in the minority and powerless because the yellow Asian horde is going to come sweep the country with their brilliance. We're not going to like that. So we're going to start attacking them. Wow. I mean, <laughs> listen, I understand how people get that dumb. I just don't understand why people don't challenge that kind of stupidity more often. I mean, finally... Finally, the other day, we had somebody challenge somebody on stupidity. Like, what's his name? Chenk Younger? Unger? He's the one of the Young Turks. And he got caught on video. Not caught. I mean, he was saying it on his show. He was saying that he, you know, bestiality is okay with him. And next day, Bernie Sanders comes out and says, Hey, you know, it's a bit of a misunderstanding. Jack Younger doesn't even want any endorsements. That's why I'm going to withdraw my endorsement from him. To get kicked off of a dem, to have somebody challenge you in the Democratic race, you have to be in favor of having sex with animals. What, what, about, what about Killer Mike, Bernie Sanders? What do you think about him? You know, the guy who writes them song, When Are You Niggas Going to Unite? and kill the police, mother, fuckers. Not a word about Killer Mike. No, he's still traveling the country, introducing Bernie, putting the word out. Yeah, Bernie's one of us. Bernie guarantees lots and lots of free stuff for us, so let's all get behind Bernie so I can make some more cool rap songs about killing cops. Not a word about that. The other night at the Democratic campaign, debate so this he had to know this was coming because the answer was too good but the correspondent for NPR the White House correspondent I believe her, her name is Yamish Alcindor no I looked it up no relation to Lou Alcindor anyway I think her parents were from Haiti anyway so she goes to, to Pete Buttigieg she asked him a question about whether we should pay reparations for all these children that Trump personally ripped away from their families and stuck in cages and tortured. Should we pay them? Even though Obama did a whole hell of a lot more than that. He's the one who started it. Now, Trump, who cares about that? So should we pay them reparations? And Boudier, without missing a beat, he just hit the script in his head. That's how you do it. He hit the script and the answer comes out. Oh, hell yeah. We got to pay the illegal aliens that come to this country reparations. Yeah, we got to do that. Uh huh. Now, after that answer, the newspapers came out and said, Buttigieg is turning to the center. Yes, he's trying to appeal to the center. Okay. <laughs> That's the center? Really? Okay. What about, what about our buddy jumping Joe Biden? He came out and said, Joe, what do you think? We, do we, should we outlaw natural gas? And Biden goes, oh, hell yeah. 
We got to, you know, we got to do wind and solar. It's a little bit out of our lane here, but it's one of these things I happen to know more than a little about because I had a bunch of clients doing this stuff. Let's talk about wind and solar just for a minute. They don't work that well. Let's talk about solar. The way solar works in this country is lots and lots of subsidies to, bu to build it. And, and lots of, to install it and lots of subsidies to build it, including some of the stuff that comes in from China. So it's, we really have kind of artificially lowered the price of solar. But then when we get it installed on our roofs or out in our, our fields or out in the desert, it doesn't work as well as anybody thinks. And, it, and, and, and even when it's at its peak, it starts degrading real quickly. But the you know, but no people don't really keep a close eye on their on, on, on the output of their solar stuff. Okay, so I'm trying not to dox anybody, but let me tell you the story. It's about it's about one of my clients had a device you would put on put on a solar panel and it would help. I'll just say I don't want to even tell you what it was, what it did. Okay, let's just say it would improve the panel. And so they went to their local power company. This power company is owned by the city. And they go, hey, can we go up on your roof and your, you know, and test our device on your panel? We're gonna on your array. We're, you know, we'll bring up 30 or 40 devices and we'll put them on each one of your panels and your array, probably more than that up there. And then we'll uh, you know, see what it does. And it would be nice to have an independent observation of exactly what this thing does. So they go up there and they put the panels on. And everybody steps back, and the the, the 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 engineers from my guys they look at their meters and they go, "Uh, this solar panel doesn't work. This is on the roof of the power company. This is in the presence of ten engineers from the power company, the people in charge of building power and that making power in that town." So the people from the power company look at the engineers from my guys and they go. Oh, no, your instruments are wrong. Oh, yeah, that thing's been producing a ton of power. They go, no, I don't think so. So everybody fiddled around with their meters for another 10 minutes. 10 minutes later, the guys from the power company goes, hey, yeah, you're right. This thing isn't producing any juice. It's because most of the solar panels in this country were not installed to produce juice. They were installed to produce tax credits and PR, the juice that it produces is like tertiary, a way distant third. There's a ton of these stories about people with these panels on their roofs, industrial facilities, where you go up there to look at and see what they're actually doing. You go up there and you learn the thing hasn't been working for a long time. Or maybe somebody installed it next to a tree. Oh yeah, the solar people don't tell you that. Trees are the absolute enemy of solar. Right along with dust. Put your solar panel out there on the cornfield. If your neighbor's out there plowing, kicking up the dust, your solar production is going to go way down when the dust settles on that. And now we have to figure in the cost of cleaning your solar panels regularly to keep them at their peak, whatever short time they have a peak. The solar doesn't work that well. It doesn't produce a lot of juice. And ditto for wind. You know, if you've ever been out in the West Coast, there's a lot more of them in the West Coast than there are in the East Coast. But you drive around these mountain passes and you see, like, you might even see a couple hundred um, windmills up there. I saw one in, in, um, in Mission Impossible. I think that was Palm Springs, where I've seen that, you know, a hundred times. And I was talking to my buddy who was the chief economist for a major, well, I can say it now, he's gone, Arco. He was the chief energy economist for Arco. I was talking to him about solar. I'm not, no, I was talking about wind. I said, what's up with all those uh, the windmills out there, Palm Springs? He goes, yeah, we take them down, but it costs more to take them down than it costs more to take them down than it's worth. We just keep them out there. A lot of them, even if, you're, even if they're spinning, they're not producing any juice. Just because they spin doesn't, make, uh, doesn't, doesn't mean they're producing juice. And you get these mega things, like there's a mega plant in California on the way to Vegas, out in the desert. All the mirrors focus. The sun, they keep the mirrors keep changing the computer, keep changing the the 
the, the, the angle of the mirror so it gets the optimal amount of sun and it reflects it right at this big bowl, huge bowl of like oil, heats up the oil. That's what turns the turbines. That was going to be like the miracle of California. Well, that thing's producing like what, 30, 35% of the energy they thought it was going to? So that's so these things aren't viable. Maybe someday in the future it will be some fairy tale future. It will be not today, but in the meantime, Biden says we should outlaw natural gas just as if it's like a casual thing. He's the one totally ignoring the real miracle, industrial miracle of the last 30 years in this country, and that is the production of natural gas in the United States through fracking. That has made us energy independent. Listen, anybody who's ever lost a member of a family in a war, we, we take this, per, at least I do, I take it personal. And the idea that we're sending kids into these combat zones just to make sure that the supply of oil and natural gas in the Mideast is flows uninterrupted to us when we have our own Saudi Arabia quantity of natural gas just sitting out there all over the country. I mean, one of the biggest deposits we have, we're not even allowed to touch it. State of New York has outlawed fracking. Wow. I mean, upstate New York is just one huge economic basket case. Buffalo, Syracuse, Albany, Utica, you know what I'm talking about up there. If you're up, if you live up there, Rochester. But the Democrats in New York somehow, for some reason, believe that we should stay dependent on foreign oil and this airy fairy story of natural uh, of of alternative fuels. In 1997, they had a, something called the Kyoto Conference. The people in all over the world, the world leaders, got together and came up with the idea: we have to set these goals for reducing greenhouse gases, reducing pollution. United States stepped up. Who was president then? Was it Bush when we got or finally got around to ratifying or not ratifying this thing? That was Bush was president then. And uh, uh, no, Bush came president in 2000. Sorry. Anyway, I think it was Bush who said, no, we're not going to do that. And her people in the Senate said, no, we're not going to do that. Ten years later, they came back and they figured out that of all the people who signed that accord, you know, none of them had met their goals for greenhouse gases, which may or may not even exist, and pollution. But the only country that did was the United States. That's because we had this massive infusion of natural gas that, that was were putting coal plants out of business, replacing them with natural gas plants. Not because Joe Biden and the geniuses in Washington, D.C. figured it out. But because these guys down in Texas finally you know, figured out this thing called fracking and they figured out how they could release this natural gas from rock. You know, I spent a couple of weeks up there in, uh, in the oil fields up in North Dakota, ground zero for this big explosion of energy up there. I got to learn a little bit about it. And I, one of my clients is, used to make parts for that would used to make a pump that you would attach to the fracking material. You have to learn a little bit about fracking. You know, you know. If, if, I know this is a little bit out of our lane, but I'll bring us back here in a minute. You, you know, the fracking is, you know, it's called fracking means fracturing. So you stick these hoses, you set off these explosions, miniature explosions, and you fracture the rock and if you see the rock that the natural gas is trapped in, you look at it and you go, I had some, I, I don't know, I just had some idea that it was, I don't know, it looked like a piece of coral or something. You know, obviously it's very porous. When it's really, it's just a really solid, dense piece of rock. And as soon as you put the little explosions through it and put some cracks in it, all this natural gas gets released. That's fracking. That's the greatest industrial development in the world over the last 20 years. And then we get Joe Biden standing up on the stage and saying, oh, yeah, we don't need natural gas. No, I don't need a thing. We'll just do the solar thing, even though it doesn't work. Don't worry about that. And we got now people are saying Biden and Buttigieg are kind of the moderate ones. How dare you? All right. So let's let's veer back into our lane gently. 
You know, every once in a while here, I think it's fair for all of us to ask ourselves. I mean, we're calling this the greatest lie of our generation, the greatest hoax of our lifetimes, but not that many people see it the way we see it. I mean, what, I mean why are we so smart? Why are we the geniuses to, to be able to call this out? And why are we the geniuses to be able to call other people out and say, hey, you've got to see this, and if you don't, that's a, that's a problem. You know, you're in denial, deceit, delusion, and it's not us. I think every once in a while, it's nice to do just a check on ourselves. Better check ourselves before we wreck ourselves or a checkup from the neck up. And so here we just checked out four guys. We checked out Biden, Buttigieg, Bernie Sanders, and Yang. Three leaders of the Democratic, three guys in, 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 that are supposed to be in the lead for the primary. We could throw Warren in that group too, you know, Pocahontas. Good Lord. And then we, th then, so they're the three leaders, but Yang is supposed to be the brainy one, right? So we got over here, we got the popular ones and the brainy ones. So we got this big mix of national quality leaders telling us fairy tales day in and day out on things that are just easily found out to be what they're saying is untrue. You know, when, when we vote on people, you know, here's what, you know, if you've been through an election or two, especially working for somebody, here's what you learn. All the time that you spend in the two or three or four months in a local election for mayor or city councilman or Congress, all the time you spend in that run up to the election, everybody's always talking about, you know, one or two things, right? That's the thing. Three months after the election, that thing is rarely around anymore. And so we have to use that thing, whatever they're talking about, as a way to judge them on how they're going to deal with other stuff that we, they don't even know exists yet. We don't even know exists yet. And so we got, we got these people running for president on the Democrat side. They're just, they're just not up for it. And if they cannot figure out natural gas, Biden can't figure out natural gas. Buttigieg cannot figure out what's wrong with giving reparations to illegal aliens. If Focahont just can't figure out why people are a little concerned that she would t lie to people to get jobs, saying falsely claiming she was an American Indian. Bernie Sanders keeps a guy around who, one, who keeps wondering, when are we niggas going to unite and kill the police, motherfucker? When you niggas going to unite and kill the police, motherfucker? These guys can't figure any of that out. How are they going to have what it takes to figure out the greatest lie of our generation? Just don't think that they are. You know, when it comes to race, a lot of the candidates are almost like people that go to a football game and they're sitting on the one side and they're cheering and cheering, cheering for one team, but you see them at halftime and you go, hey, how you like the game? See, your team's winning and they insist to you that they're not really cheering for one side they're just here to watch some good football. Well, that's what we hear from all the candidates that, you know, they want to bring the races together. We're not just picking on white people, even though anybody who says we're picking on white people, that makes you a very bad person. If you say it's okay to be white, that makes you a worse person. Yeah, just a, it was only a couple weeks ago down in Oklahoma City, where a guy who put up a flyer university, at Oklahoma City Law School he was visited by the FBI, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, for putting up a flyer that said it's okay to be white. Anyway, so all these guys are saying, yeah, we got to bring people together. But we know that's not true. We know that's part of the hoax because we know that the only time uh, Buttigieg and Warren and Biden and Yang and all the rest of these clowns around the country, including a lot of fellas and lovely ladies, the only time they pay attention to shootings or to something they call hate crimes is when there's a white person doing it. Okay, I'll give you a couple of examples right away. I mean, just a couple of days ago, one day we had two mass... Now you got me misstating the facts. I almost said one day we had two mass shootings. No, one day we there was like... In the last week, there's been like 20 mass shootings in this country. There's been like five in Philly alone. Three or I don't care. I don't even care if you say three or more or four or more. But not one day we had seven people shot in one place in Baltimore, 13 shot in Englewood outside of Chicago. And whenever that happens, I always watch my Twitter feed 
I always go to, you know, the candidate to see if anybody's tweeting out anything about we have to strengthen our communities, we have to do better, we have to get rid of the gun, you know, have to get rid of the guns. And the answer is no. Whenever the fellas holding the gun, and we know fellas are holding the gun, 75% of the times at least in mass shootings, we know there will be silence from Yang, Boudigier, Warren, Sanders, Biden. They just don't do the whole, you know, hearts and minds thing. But let something happen, an isolated event happen in Iowa where a meth head run, hits a, a Mexican girl with a car. Then it's time to stop the world. Here's another, okay, here's a story. I don't know why, okay, why didn't we stop the world for this story? Why didn't Biden and Boudigier, Warren, Sanders, Yang, why didn't they stop this world for the story when according to this headline in the New York Post, Oregon woman, Oregon woman, poured soda on food cart worker, told her to go back to Mexico. Oh, that's not even close to being the worst thing she did. So you see a picture of a, a very heavy set, a Lizzo like lovely lady out of uh, Chicago, uh, out of Oregon. I'm sorry, what cunt county is that? An Oregon woman is facing hate crime charges for telling a Mexican, dumping soda on a Mexican food cart worker, telling her to go back to Mexico. The beef began when Sierra McDonald, a lovely lady, 30 years old, um, she ordered cart from the Portland cart, ordered food from the Portland cart. And she refused to pay for it, saying it was too expensive. Have you ever been, if you've ever been in a corner store in an integrated, seg, integrated neighborhood, yeah, that's a black move. You walk in, you order, you know, somebody, the person in front of you, some Lizzo-like lady, ordering is ordering a sandwich or a sub. She tells what she wants on it. The prices are clearly marked. Twenty minutes later, she's at the register, going. Hey, this thing's too expensive. I don't want it anymore. A lady, we said it was six, you know, five ninety-five. It, it's up there, posted. That's we're just beginning with this one. Ah, uh, she also doused the woman's grill and her chicken with some beverage. The cops tried to find her. They so she ran away from them. Uh, now, this woman who, who tried to destroy this cart and assault the worker, she got mad that the worker called the cops. So this, this woman, this black, big black woman, returned later that, that day and threatened the worker and another, and another employee with a wooden stake with a pointed tip. Then she is accused of spitting onto the food cart and trying to toss the chicken off the grill which basically means, for some crazy reason, they had to get rid of all the food that woman touched. She later told the cops she thought workers at the food cart were racist because, quote, they served white people faster than they served her. Anyway, so they arrested her on a bunch of stuff, uh, including, I think, they, I think they threw a hate crime charge on her. Does anybody, does anybody think that's abnormal? Does anybody think that's unusual? Yeah, well, it's not. Here's a little story out of my own little town. But this story is like, there's two stories here that, to me, they're just a little bit out of the norm. That's why I wanted to bring them to your attention. Headline, 15-year-old boy shot twice, leaving Christiana Skating Center Monday night. So it's a roller rink. And this was a roller rink where lots and lots of fellas and lovely ladies get dropped off by their parents Lots and lots of argy-bargy happens. The kid's getting out of the roller rink, goes into a car with mommy who's picking him up. Some fellas drive by, shoot him in the legs. Bing, bam, boom. Normally, they play these stories down. Normally, they just pretend like, well, that's just kind of normal. But I don't know why they did this one. They started giving us a laundry list of all the teens that have had fights, translation, black riots at this mall over the last two years, and he just kept going one after another. Hundreds of people this, hundreds of people did that. People shooting here, people getting shot there. Over and over and over, right down the street from good old Collins Place, just a couple miles. And so maybe, maybe because it's Christmas, maybe because I'm just feeling expansive today. We can look at a story like that and, and, and tell ourselves that people in Delaware understand what that means. 
especially when a minister showed up at the hospital bedside and everybody knows, knows the minister. He's very famous around here as a black minister who's always tending to the fellas and lovely ladies when they get shot. He was right on the scene reminding everybody that without his help, no one will ever solve the problem of gun violence in murder capital, murder city, USA, Wilmington, Delaware. So sometimes these stories, you know, we kind of have to, we want, you know, we kind of have to enter, enter through the back door to see what was going on. I kind of think that was one of those stories there, the story about the Christiana Mall. Right across the river, across from Philly, not too far from here, at a place in Cherry Hill, New Jersey, they had a big mall two years ago in 2017. Over a thousand fellows and lovely ladies going rampaging through the mall. Yeah, we did stories on it here, several, because there was lots of videos Lots of lots of storekeepers, lots of mall owners in a pure panic because if a mall becomes, if it becomes known that this mall is the kind of place where fellas and lovely ladies turn into an occasion of frequent black mob violence, the women will just stay away. Yeah, who do you think's in the mall spending all the money? It's the women. They don't want anything to do with this topic. They'll stay away from it. They walk away from it. Women do not like listening to these podcasts. A lot of them don't. And, and they don't like li watching the videos. They especially don't like watching the videos of women being assaulted, abused, murdered, and raped by the fellas, even though it has a direct connection to their the, 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 the safety and welfare of them and their family. That's just a plain fact. I'm sorry it is. But every once in a while, we get a little story that just kind of reminds us what is really up. And this kind of is a good one from Cherry Hill across from Philly, where the local radio station says, hey, starting the 26th, if you're over, if you're under 18, you better have some, you better have a parent with you. And if there's no parent, you're over 18, you better have some ID or we will escort you off the premises because we, it says this in the print, not in the radio version, says we're going to stop tolerating criminal behavior. So there's a curfew for people. But it's weird when I saw them, they say, we're no longer going to continue to tolerate criminal behavior. It's like, why did you tolerate it before? I mean, who, who sent that memo out? Yes, we're going to tolerate a certain amount of criminal behavior here at the Cherry Hill Mall because, well, that's just what we do around here in an effort to connect with our customers. Anyway, let's hear, the, let's hear a little bit about the Cherry Hill Mall. Well, the Cherry Hill Mall is taking steps to prevent another melee on the day after Christmas. Here's KYW's Mike Dinart. Police and Cherry Hill Mall management don't want a repeat of 2017 when a thousand marauding teenagers rampaged through the mall on the day after Christmas, resulting in the arrests of five people. Cherry Hill Police Chief William Bud Monahan says last year the mall closed early at 6 p.m. And the people who really want to come out for a good reason to go shopping and take advantage of, you know, the restaurants that are at the mall and, and the surrounding area. And it almost punishes them for the misbehavior of these kids that are unattended. So this year on December 26th, no one under 18 can be in the mall without an adult between 4 and 9 p.m. Mall security will be checking ages of people entering after 4 p.m. And police plan extra patrols not only inside the mall, but outside as well. Mike DiNardo, KYW News Radio. You know, most of the, all of the songs we do on this channel that everybody loves come, of course, from Alan the Barbershop Song Guy living in an undisclosed loca secret location somewhere on the continental United States. Anyway, another guy just sent us a song, too. He's, he's kind of a musician. He enjoys making music, enjoys writing songs. He sent me one called The 12 Days of Kwanzaa. Why don't we give that a listen? Good old cocaine tree 
On the third day of quads of my own boy gave the beat Three dead dead bulls to drive by Land up there from the cocaine tree On the fourth day of quads of my own boy gave the beat Four smashed teeth, three pit bulls to drive by Land up there from the cocaine tree a little christmas reminder christmas has you know come to think of it kwanzaa doesn't have 12 days christmas has 12 days kwanzaa has like seven days anyway christmas has 12 days i'm gonna give you a i'm gonna and, and if you're not in the mood for christmas even though you're listening to this on christmas day maybe the day or two after christmas not too late music gets people in the mood for christmas I remember reading this, I forget where I read it, but I know where it came from. It came from Rolling Stone, but somebody else published it. And it said, you know, I think the best Christmas album ever recorded 
is Winona Judd's Christmas songs. So I said, okay, I'll give that a try. Listen to it. You know, it's kind of it's kind of religious music, sacred music. And when I was done listening to it, it was like, yeah, I think that is one of the best Christmas. I think that is the greatest Christmas record ever. So if you want to get some help getting into the Christmas spirit, there's still 12 days of Christmas left. Give would give Winona a a uh, a try, but also give uh, the album we just cut cut and, and are, are streaming live. A lot of people are getting this. A lot of people are playing this at their Christmas parties. Have yourself a very fella Christmas. You can get it at cdbaby.com. Just put Colin Flaherty in there, or go to my minds.com slash Colin Flaherty. You'll see, uh, you'll see the the you'll see the graphic for it and the the exact address to get you right there. These songs are funny, very very funny. People love these songs. So if you're having a little gathering at Christmas, mix them up with your Winona songs with songs from Alan the Barbershop Guy, and uh, I think your guests will get as much of a kick out of it as the people who watch and listen to these podcasts do. Okay, let's get this. This one just came across. I just found this one by accident by when I was looking for the Cherry Hill story. This is, this is just another story, another, another wound, another insult, another blow to the family, the Skellenegger family in Philadelphia who lost their 30-something-year-old son, go-getter, the whole world in front of him, good-looking guy, college athlete, real estate developer, running around downtown Philly. Next thing you know, a guy named Michael White inserts himself, a fella inserts himself into a situation he didn't belong to, takes his knife out, stabs Skellenegger, Sean Skellenegger in the back, killing him. It was a Bronx jury. But, but even though they didn't kill him, convict him of murder, this is a typical for a Bronx jury, get somebody up there for murder, say, well, you know, we're not sure about the murder thing, but we're pretty sure you were jaywalking, so we'll give, you know, you're, you're convicted of jaywalking, don't do that again. Well, that's what they did here. They convicted, this, they convicted Michael White of tampering with evidence, the phone and the knife. And so the parents of Sean Skellenegger, the victim, the dead white guy, want to come in and tell the deliver a victim impact statement. And apparently the judge has decided that would be, no, that would not be any good whatsoever. The family of Sean Skellinger, the man stabbed to death nearly two years ago near Rittenhouse Square, will not be allowed to give victim impact statements at a sentencing hearing for Michael White. KYW's crime and justice reporter Kristen Johansson has more. Victim impact statements are meant for judges to take into consideration for sentencing. But since a jury found Michael White not guilty of voluntary manslaughter in the 2018 stabbing death of Sean Skellinger, Judge Glenn Bronson said it would be an error of law to allow them to give victim impact statements. Judge Bronson acknowledged the Skellinger family's tremendous loss, noting it was horrible and said Sean was a beloved person who was doing great things in the city, but followed up that since a jury found White did not commit a crime when he killed Skellinger, it would be an abuse of discretion for him to allow their testimony. White was convicted of tampering with evidence for tossing the knife, but the judge said the family is not a direct victim of that conviction. White will be sentenced next month. Man, I had all these other things I wanted to put on here today, but everything just keeps slipping away from us. So much material, so little time. I wanted to read a couple letters from our viewers. I wanted to do a big story about out in, how out in Portland, Oregon, they're having a panic. They're building a new wing on their subway system, a new spur on their light rail system. Now everybody's starting to freak because they're they're constantly being reminded that the, the light rail they have now is just one big place for fellas and lovely ladies to create a lot of violent chaos mayhem. And now the people in Portland who are going to connect to the new subway are th- thinking, hey, they really, they wouldn't do that to us, would they? They really just wouldn't build a mass transit system for criminals so they could come into our neighborhoods and wreak havoc on our families. They wouldn't do that, would they? The answer is yes. So we'll get to that one of these days, along with a couple of letters from teachers. 
Um, even if, especially, even if especially having teachers from the front lines write in and tell their unvarnished story, especially if that makes the black kids angry. Talk to you tomorrow. On the first day of Kwanzaa, my homeboy gave the sheep a bag from the cocaine tree. On the second day of Kwanzaa, my homeboys gave the sheep two drive-bys and a bag from the good old Six vacant houses, five.